So we are back with another great Dark Beyond card review. Today we're looking at some Death Knight stuff and we have a couple crazy looking legendaries and perhaps crazy for different reasons. The first one here is Exarch Maladar. Six mana, single unholy rune, five, five Draenei with Battlecry. The next card you play this turn costs corpses instead of mana. And that is a scary amount of mana cheat as far as I'm concerned, because getting to, you know, 10 corpses by turn six, absolutely not that crazy, which means you can cheat out some full cost stuff on turn six. I, you know, I mean, in theory, you know, maybe it's 100 corpses. <laughs> Not my turn six. Obviously, if you're turning corpses, this card is also going to be discounted a little bit. Hey, that's that's the dream primo target, the ceaseless expanse. But really, you know, Reno, Yag, like all these great, you know, expensive cards, climactic necrotic explosion for your rainbow deck, right? This could be a way to get this down sooner. Generally, not a card you want to play too early, but uh, it was confirmed that. The corpses used on uh, the uh, the Exarch Maldar itself will juice up your Climactic Necrotic Explosion, so if you wanted to, but basically there are just so many good things to cheat out early, whether that's 10 costs, sometimes it might not be 10 costs, sometimes just six costs, seven costs, whatever, some removal cards, some stabilizer, some, uh, you know, crazy legendary like this one the eight hands from beyond <laughs> this is uh maybe not as crazy good or scary as exarch maladar but definitely an insane card the art the the effect here battle cry destroy both players decks except the eight highest cost cards in each so uh that could be a pretty big play on turn six if you're trying to use this as a win condition somehow we'll talk more about this later i don't know how effective that's going to be but ultimately here maladar I, just this much mana cheat and being able to cheat out the big stuff faster than you're supposed to on turn six you know even turn five with a coin or whatever that's going to create some really big swing turns some really big stabilizations we're actually going to look at another uh 10 cost card here which might be great for exarch maladar this is another single unholy rune uh, obviously can, can squeeze in right there and it's got taunt and reborn and this big death rattle resurrect a different friendly death rattle minion so that could be a great stabilizer a couple taunt bodies here they're also resurrecting some death rattles you played earlier to generate some corpses, you know, and you've just got yourself a monster board on turn six out of nowhere, thanks to Maladar and um, these corpses. And then the single and holy rune on this means, you know, toss it in rainbow, totally fine. That absolutely works. Toss it in a full and holy build, you know, we don't know, but it's got enough flexibility there with that single rune that this card just looks like a dream to me for Death Knight. I, I guess, you know, occasionally you might say, hey, I, you know, I didn't have enough corpses. This was sitting dead in hand a little bit, but I don't think that's a huge risk because sometimes even if it's just like, you know, a free 5-5, five five, you kind of play down and you had just enough corpses to like play a six drop alongside it, you know, sometimes that free 5-5 five five might just feel like the little difference maker and other times it's going to let you play that really big card sooner than you're supposed to and that's going to help you cheat out win. So all in all, I think the payoff here is really high and the ask on this card with the corpses the rune, the cost is not so dramatic. So uh, that, that seems like a really favorable equation for this one. So moving on to the eight hands from beyond. Uh, dude, I love the look of this card so freaking much. It's Starro from DC Comics. I love it, dude. It's an eight mana, eight, eight, double blood, which could be a pretty big limiter for this card. It, you know, double blood or triple blood, whatever, has not been the most successful archetype in Death Knight lately, of course. We've seen a lot more on the uh, the rainbow side. We've even seen some more on holy slanted decks. So uh, this could be a way to bring back some double blood with this battle cry. Destroy both players' decks except the eight highest cost cards in each. So basically saying, look, we're gonna throw away all the garbage from our decks, and we're just gonna have this brawl with our best and biggest cards, right? And you're hoping that your best and biggest cards can go toe to toe with your opponents. There are also some benefits to, uh, you know, thinning the deck in essence. Um, like if you play this and then you play a Helia, you know, your Helia is going to shuffle in three plagues. Those plagues are going to be a huge portion of their deck. And, and, you know, that basically will accelerate the speed at which those plagues start ticking off. Could give you an advantage. Um, it does mean you're kind of waiting to, to play your Helia because if you play her first, the plagues are all just going to get destroyed, of course, by the eight hands from beyond. So the question kind of becomes like um, two things. Like, do you have time to play this? Because it is just a big old eight mana eight eight. It's just kind of fat and slow. Like, you know, maybe Exarch Maladar squeezes in there and 
allows you to cheat it out a little sooner. But then number two, like, you know, depending on the matchup you're playing, can you go toe to toe with their biggest cards? And certainly if you build your deck slanted towards that, you're going to have a lot of greed, you know, hopefully you're, you're equipping your deck with the value necessary or even some way to mitigate any sort of fatigue risk or whatever, or generate extra value that outpaces the opponent. I don't know that Death Knight's the best at that. You know, you kind of imagine a lot of the times like Warrior and Priest are kind of the kings of, we're going to go late and, and do these, you know, big threat brawls down the road. They can generate just so much absurd value and life gain and stuff that it's hard to match on occasion. And then if you're playing like faster decks, you know, aggro decks, mid-range decks, just whatever kind of random combo decks or whatever, there's a good chance you kind of mess up their game plan. I will say for aggro decks, you do probably improve their draw. And if they're close to killing you, you know, if you're playing a little bit from behind, by the time you spl slam an eight mana, eight, eight that did nothing, and you just give them their best cards in deck, there's a chance this would just be far too risky to play against an aggro deck. That said, also, if you've made it to turn eight alive and feel like you can play this, you probably already won the game anyway against faster decks. So like still why play this? You know what I mean? Like it's not exactly a win condition or a stabilizer. It might introduce some unnecessary risk when you're already in a pretty good spot. So in other words, this does feel very narrow in its ability to create opportunities in a game that didn't already exist or, you know, find game states where you're you're looking for a favorable matchup on those final eight cards it, it just i don't know how often that's going to be impactful or matter it's just such a rare occurrence and game state where you're like you're playing the control deck and i want to go this deep i want to go late i want to play a hell you like that it feels like it feels like such a big commitment and then if you are reliant on that game plan you're not always going to have this early right it's just a one of legendary so sometimes tough to hit those on time so all in all, you know, it's kind of a cool, like weird secondary, really secondary, thirdly, is that a word? Thirdly win condition, you know? Like it's it's not gonna be the, the best or, or primary way you win games. It almost feels like a Hail Mary. It almost feels more like something you'll discover and be like, okay, yeah, this is good for this particular game, but might be hard to run in decks otherwise. So big, flashy, absolutely crazy as far as the effect is concerned. I'm just not sure it's all that good so moving on over to the uh starship stuff for death knights we have the spirits passage as their starship it's got a spooky skull there it's a the the first starship piece is the soulbound spire a three mana two two death rattle summon a minion with cost equal to this minion's attack up to 10 so on the piece itself you know this is this is just a couple little bodies which you know is actually not terrible right so you know two two that summons a two two it's not great by any means but it's a couple little corpses it's just you know get the gears moving get some stuff on board keep the opponent busy then we look at the guiding figure as well i kind of sort of put these out of order of cost do note this is two but it seemed important uh this is a three two with spell burst trigger a random friendly minions death rattle so uh, you know, there is a, a world where these two do go together and you get a little bonus death rattle off the Soulbound Spire. But then importantly, once these are both dead and they go into your starship and you launch your starship, you will then have the spell burst here of the guiding figure on your starship and this death rattle as well. And now suddenly your minion will have much higher attack because you've combined all of your starship pieces together. Even with just these two, you're already up to a five attack starship which means you will then trigger a friendly minions death rattle it does not say other friendly minions death rattle so it can hit itself as the starship which means you will summon a five drop off of the spell burst or you know much bigger as you add more and more uh starship pieces into the mix so you know get up to a, a 10 power starship when you play four of these and suddenly you're just going to be summoning a lot of big crazy stuff off of all these uh, spell bursts, which could be mean like, hey, you know, as soon as we get to five mana, we go for a quick tempo or you save it up a little bit, try to get, you know, turn turn six, turn seven, turn eight, get a really big swing on board with your starship. Now, admittedly, this is just kind of bored. It's not reactive. It doesn't have any way to address the opponent's stuff unless you roll some rush minions or taunts off of this uh, this random summoning. So it is a bit helpless in a way, but man, it is going to be a really threatening board when it hits. We'll also note that the uh, the support spell here is Suffocate, a four mana shadow spell. This allows you to destroy a minion. If you're building a starship, also destroy a random neighbor. So the kind of base assassinate, 
that uh, can hit, uh, you know, a card next to it, which, you know, usually there's two or three things on board. You might be able to line this up against the right stuff, but your opponent could stagger the two big things, something in the middle and create some weirdness. But, you know, th this is probably okay at best. We don't really like four mana assassinates these days. Most removal is, is, is trending a lot cheaper than that. The slight upside on this destroying a neighbor does help because there are those boards where it's like, hey, two five fives, that's really annoying to deal with. Like, let's just play the suffocate, get this over with while I start developing my own crazy threatening board potentially off of my starship. I'll also note there's one other card here I wanted to take a look at, the Orbital Moon. I think this is pretty cool with your starship because you need a cheap spell to activate that spell burst. And this gives a minion taunt which and lifesteal, which does help create some extra survivability off that board you're launching with your starship in case it's kind of helpless and just sitting there. It's like, okay, look, this makes sure I have something defensive happening, potentially some life gain as well. Now, on the second half of this, I do have a question about how this works. If you played an adjacent card this turn, also give it reborn. I don't know what happens if you give your starship reborn. I don't know if these stats are considered like you know enchantments the, the base starship is just nothing as we can see here right it has no cost no stats so i think when you give it reborn it should inherit the same pieces and stats right and of course it comes back with one health as reborn but it should have these death rattles as a part of it it seems like it's forming a new minion it's like uh in fact we could probably watch a video of the starships and see if they have green numbers or or white numbers and that would tell us yeah i just confirmed it does indeed have white numbers when you launch the starship so that should absolutely work which is potentially really good right so not only giving you that cheap spell burst activator but also giving you an insane reborn starship assuming that works as as designed or as as i as i read it which uh this could be a really really nice activator for your starship which Gives me a little hope that this has that chance. So this does have some cool death rattle synergies, like, yeah, okay for corpses, just bodies on board, a little bit more threatening, but with some ways to enable it defensively as well. So moving back over to that Awakener of Souls we took a quick look at. This is a 10 mana single unholy, 8-7 with Taunt, Reborn, and Death Rattle Resurrect, a different friendly Death Rattle minion. And this is one of those cards, like, clearly this is a tin drop that does a lot of stuff as you need big tin drops to do. I will say, though, that I do think this is one that kind of has to be cheated out early to really be an absolutely crazy kind of card. Like, you know, we saw Exarch Maladar. If you cheat that out, like, yes. Okay, great. How reliably does that happen in a deck list, though? Not that reliably, because that is a one of legendary when we look at something like big spell mage you know they have multiple ways to make sure those big spells can get down early does death knight have access to the same tools for something like wakener of souls and then does wakener of souls win the game like big spell mage does with stuff like tsunami no right it still just sits there kind of passively it's nice that it has taunts and reborn but as a game wears on in particular that's not that hard to push through seven health and then one health on the remaining aspect so if you can force this death rattle to resurrect some other defensive stuff and like as they push through the wakener of souls another taunt pops up and another taunt pops up and those have death rattles to do something defensive then you could maybe create the kind of chain that is just defensive enough uh to, to to make this worth it but otherwise you kind of worry that this won't stabilize it'll just kind of be a, a pile of random bodies with just a couple taunts that are disruptive and especially if you know you're spending a full 10 mana on this this feels like it's just not going to keep up it's just gonna it's just gonna sit there opponents will push through and just keep doing their thing just keep driving towards their win condition when this is a little bit on the back foot and a little bit too passive in those instances so I do think this is the kind of card that needs help, but I will say the reward on it is significant enough. It is synergistic enough that as soon as that pops up, and it's probably got to be a little more than just Maladar, but maybe some other things show up in the future. Maybe there's some things right now that can help enable this. This is the right kind of tin drop to be good in those scenarios. It just needs that help. It just needs a deck that gets it there. And that is an important distinction because there's a lot of tin drops that don't have that. <laughs> there's a lot of tin drops that are just slow and bad and don't have that opportunity but i think this does have a chance to actually be competitive because it's just doing so much right there are just so many pieces to this puzzle so moving on here to the akanai death speaker one mana single unholy one three dranai after another friendly minion is reborn summon a copy of it which clearly we've got some big reborn stuff that this could summon copies of 
that's a pretty big ask, I think, for the Awakener of Souls. Also note that it's summoning the copy after it has utilized its reborn. So, you know, that, that just means you're going to get the back half, I guess, of this. It's not like you're going to get one that's going to actually have another reborn cycle and it's like two total bodies. But still, clearly, some, some great potential effects, especially anytime you're combining, you know, reborns and death rattles. This could create a, a series of, of extra bodies and corpses and stickiness all for only one mana and it's definitely hard to fault a one mana one three with a positive effect it, you know it's not a, a a big task to put this in your deck and just say hey look there's a little bonus here and there that said it is kind of challenging i think to to use this guy or find the right moments for him and in particular like you know you got to have cards that survive into your turn very often so like you know let's play down a reborn thing on turn three and then did the opponent kill it? Yeah, okay, shoot. The Reborn's already activated. The Alcanine Death Speaker is awkwardly stuck in hand. I can't play it out with the Reborn card because obviously it'll just kill the uh, the Death Speaker first, so that's going to suck. So then it's like how many Reborn things stick or maybe how many Reborn things have like Rush, for instance, where you're just trying to, to do it all at once with the Alcanine Death Speaker and how big are those and how often do you want to pay the one-man attacks of the Alcanai Death Speaker as opposed to playing those sorts of things on curve. So while I don't ever want to just like write off a 1-3 that seems like a free nice little bonus, at the same time, it's a slot in your deck. It, it, it shifts your curve around a little bit. I do think there will be points where it's just really hard to get this down unless you're super far ahead on board. So it, it could in that case be just a little bit clunky. I, I will say the Orbital Moon technically has some synergies here. If you give something Taunt and Reborn, you could kind of hide the death speaker behind it if the opponent can't snipe it like yeah there's something kind of cool there but not that hard necessarily to snipe this through a taunt so i think a fine card but just one that that a lot of decks won't necessarily find the spot for because it probably sits more awkwardly in hand more often than you expect unless you just play this on one and hope for the best and, and it just kind of lingers around and gets an occasional upside and you're not mad because it was just you know it's a one three i will note you know there are a couple you know kind of uh very synergistic looking things we've seen recently for this that aren't loading for some reason right now why aren't these loading i guess the brittle bone buccaneer is the primo example here this is maybe not the actually the best example but you know cheap little reborn stuff this has been a very common card as of late as well so there is kind of a you know very focused death battle reborn package that this seems like a good fit for if not absolutely a crazy fit just a good one all right, so next up here is Assimilating Blight, another card that kind of goes with this reborn early game package. Three mana spell, one blood, two unholy, discover a three cost death rattle minion, and uh, summon it with reborn. So another good little reborn body in the early game. And I will say too, when looking at this card, I was pleasantly surprised with the pool of stuff because it is discover. So when you're looking at death knight, uh, three cost minions and death knight right now, I think these are both totally fine with me. Like Frostbitten Freebooter is really annoying to deal with, especially with Reborn. And then when you look at the neutral three drops, like definitely a little more, you know, there's some low rolls here, I think for sure. But with Discover, it, it, I don't know if there's three totally, totally dead cards that you're just mad about, you know? Some of them don't really do anything because a lot of it's like tied to their to their battle cry or whatever. Like, like Terrible Chef and Ravenous Kraken aren't going to be great. But even stuff like Messmaker, right? Even, you know, Iridescent Gyroworm is actually pretty solid. Uh, Gattle Snake, like, okay, I'll take this, man. It's not that It's not that bad. You may not have a lot of Draenei for Crimson Commander, but worst case scenario, right, is that scenario where it's like, it's kind of a piloted shredder almost in a lot of worlds, you know? It's just, maybe Mounted Raptor is a better example in this case for old school examples. But it's just a couple bodies, worst case. And then sometimes you'll just get stuff like Clearance Promoter that's like, okay, yeah, I'll take some awesome discounts, dude. That's actually not bad at all. Bucket of Soldiers. Yeah, I'll take a million corpses off of the Assimilating Blight, right? So uh, I think this is actually a pretty solid little little uh, little piece for this kind of early game. Swarmy, Death Rattle, Reborn, uh, Unholy package uh, this actually gives me a little bit more faith even in the uh in the alkani death speaker as well like i kind of i i kind of have a little bit more hope for this although again probably not really technically the the best targets for the alkani but just more consistency at least and then our final card here is airlock breach uh big old six mana spell one blood one unholy summon a five five undead with taunt 
and give your hero plus five health spin five corpses to do it again and um i i do actually kind of like this two five fives with taunt still not the most exciting play on turn six we've had a, a few examples like this but it's something, it's bodies, and importantly, you also get 10 health off of this as well. If you didn't get the 10 health off this, obviously, I, I don't think this would go far enough, but the 10 health is a really nice bonus. This becomes a good way to buy yourself some time. Disruptive taunt bodies on board, just, you know, deal with these, solve this little problem. I'm gaining life, I'm moving into the end game. I'm maybe, you know, a rainbow deck, I'm buying time. I'm also spinning corpses. For my climactic necrotic explosion i'm happy that all of this is going on i think there's scenarios where you play exarch maladar uh, exarch maladar and then you play airlock breach on six you're not mad right like that's okay it's a pretty good turn i got three five fives i got five uh ten extra health and i'm just off to the races right so it, you know it, th this needs all of this and it needs to go off twice obviously to be any good it's not going to work at its base level but uh, your deck will take care of that you should always have five corpses uh, by turn six i mean i guess you could have spent some on something else but reliably you should be able to hit this and i think it's pretty solid there it's like a little bit of vampiric blood but with some bodies attached and um that's pretty cool i i think this card is actually rather solid so all that said let's go ahead and uh rate these cards from one to five stars exarch maladar is a five star card the eight hands from beyond is a two star card soulbound spire is a three star card guiding figure is a three star card suffocate is a three star card wakener of souls is a three star card Akanai death speaker is a four star card orbital moon is a three star card airlock breach is a four star card assimilating blight is a four star card and uh yeah that's your death knight stuff i was really teetering on the um the starship stuff here between three and four but i don't know man i i think it's gonna be slow to ramp this up like i i imagine a good starship but i think playing these on curve and like just getting these down it's like you're really gonna fall behind and i don't know if the starship has the stabilization necessary to recover the kind of downturns you took so i gave those a, a, a bit of a push down to three Waking of Souls, I gave a bump from two to three because I just think it has a lot of stuff going on. And then I, I do like these Death Riddle cards, although you wonder sometimes, are the Reborn cards, if they have enough kind of uh, deck fit. That said, I think Maladar is for sure. Uh, this guy looks really scary. I think, I think Mana Cheat is always a consideration. So anyway, share your thoughts on these cards down below. Thanks as always for watching. And until next time, game on.